And so now I'd like to introduce Marianne Elliott, who's joined us all the way from New Zealand. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, all of you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And in fact, when Rebecca invited me, I think it was something of an act of instinct and faith. I don't think either of us were certain what, uh, what my purpose was here at the summit, why I needed to be here. We both uh, trusted that there would be a reason. And um, I prepared a talk for this morning and I just threw it out because it's emerged very clearly to me between conversations yesterday and what I heard this morning, why I'm here. And so I'll get to that in a minute. But first I wanna talk a little bit about what I stand for and how that has evolved uh, in my life. When I was a child, when we did earlier talking and yesterday talking about um, you know, what it, what it was in our childhood that really defined who we were, what defined me as a child was this extraordinary, extraordinary, like overwhelming sense of justice and injustice, combined with a very profound uh, capacity for empathy, so that it didn't matter whether an observed injustice was happening to a child in my classroom at my school, or to an adult on the other side of the world, it broke my heart. It broke my heart, it didn't, it, distance made no difference, difference made no difference, and it broke my heart in a way that was overwhelming for a child. And so I very early on decided that I had to take a stand. And so my childhood, and God bless my parents for supporting me in this, my childhood was marked by me becoming an advocate, a human rights advocate from a very early age. And uh, where I saw injustice in my classroom was where, I, you know, that's your first domain really of authority. Uh, I spent a lot of time standing up to teachers who I felt were, t you know, were being unjust to other students. So, you know, I was often in trouble at school for this and my parents uh, were very supportive. So this, what I stood for as a child was justice. And this very strong belief that, that uh, you know, it, it, it was wrong. And it, it just it felt so deeply wrong that some people didn't have justice. And what that led to was a career as a human rights advocate. I worked, um, and it, it, yeah, what is interesting is I ended up working for a decade predominantly in conflict and post-conflict settings. So war zones is what we're talking about. I worked in you know some of the most notorious war zones of our you know of, of the the past decade. And there's a myth about people who go to work in war zones, which is that they are kind of thick-skinned, uh, you know, professionally detached from what's going on around them, and perhaps even kind of cynical about it a little bit. Well, I'm here to say not all of us. Right, definitely not me. Always had this deep sense of empathy, and that, that carried on, and that I took that with me into my work in war zones. And one of my first jobs was with a renowned human rights lawyer named Raji Sorani from Gaza in the Gaza Strip. And I, was, I arrived in his office, and within a week I was in his office bawling my eyes out, you know, sobbing with what I was seeing and what I was dealing with in Gaza. And Raji said to me, listen, Marianne, if you're going to survive in this line of work, you're going to have to toughen up. And then he made it his mission for the next two years that we worked together to toughen me up. And at the end of my time there, uh, in my, he was giving a speech in my farewell, and he said, uh, you know, I achieved many things with Miss Marianne, and we had, you know, we had an enormously successful time together, but in one thing, I failed completely. Marianne is as soft-hearted as the day she turned up on my doorstep, and she's taught me that that is also a way to do this work. And I learned that my soft heart was not my liability. That in fact it was because I approached my work with such an open heart that I was able to truly feel the suffering of the people who I was there to serve. And that this enabled me to experience a really profound transformation which shifted what I stand for. So there's a reason why it hurts me when you're being hurt. Because we're actually connected. And that was an experience I was only able to fully have because I had this soft and open heart. And so what I stand for now is not justice, although I believe justice is incredibly important, but I stand for connection. I stand for connection. Because the reason that war exists, that we're, that it's a, that we're able to hurt each other in the way that we hurt each other is because of this experience that we have or this, this belief we have that we're separate. 
And so what, uh, so I spent, you know, as I say, a decade, I worked in, in the Gaza Strip in Timor-Leste, just post-independence. I worked in Afghanistan for two years. And uh, I'm home now in New Zealand, working as a consultant, a human rights consultant. But I'm also, as, as Robbie mentioned, I'm a yoga teacher. Where does that fit in? Where it fits in is that, uh, if, First, we need to be connected to ourselves. This connection that will transform how we interact, interact with each other, that will transform how we deal with each other, begins with ourselves. And our bodies are a big part of that. And in the line of work that I worked in, and the decade I spent in war zones, uh, it's a survival mechanism, I understand that, but people are all up here. Everything's going on from here up. And some of us are also operating here. What goes on from here on down is largely ignored. And we store stuff in our bodies and we carry things in our bodies and, and what is carried and unacknowledged is driving us and we don't even realize it. And it might be driving us to do great work, but if what's driving us to do that great work is guilt and grief, it, it, we may be doing the great work, but that great guilt and grief is infused in everything that we're doing. And so yoga has enabled me to get into my body, move the stuff that, that I was carrying. And believe me, for the first six months of yoga, I, every time I got into a hip opener, I just sobbed. Because I had grief for like the whole world in my hips. So, you know, yoga has enabled me to do that. And so uh, that's a big part of what I stand for now is is really supporting people who do this work, who are passionate, who are taking a stand to, uh, to, to find the tools and practices that enable them to reconnect with themselves. Because it's when we're connected and deeply plugged in to our truest self that we can do our best work in the world. So it's a big part of what I stand for. And you're going to hear a little more this afternoon from my colleague Matt and I. And some of you had the pleasure of doing a yoga practice with my other colleague Gabby this morning. And we work for an organization called Off the Mat Into the World. Or we work with an organization called Off the Mat Into the World. And you're going to hear more about this, that this afternoon. I also run online yoga and well-being courses, uh, which is my way of taking these practices of well-being to people who are scattered all over the world doing amazing work, can't get to a yoga class, can't do the things that I couldn't do in Afghanistan, don't have a community of practice to support them. So it's a big part of my work. The other thing that I just want to um, put a, 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 you know, a flag up for is connection through story, because that's come up over and over again over the past two days. And uh, when I left Afghanistan, I was given uh, permission and also responsibility by my dearest, dearest Afghan colleague to tell my story of my experience in Afghanistan as a way of being a, a, um, a kind of an entry point into a different uh, picture of Afghanistan, a different experience of Afghanistan to what we see basically in the, in, the, in the media. And if you want to pick a country where Mona's description of the angry bearded man and the, you know, kind of covered woman is all we get to see, you know, Pakistan is one, Saudi Arabia, but Afghanistan may be near the top of the list. You know, and it breaks my heart that that's what we see of Afghanistan because that is not the Afghanistan that I know and love. So I've written this book. It's called Zen Under Fire. Uh, it's about my experience of learning to sit still and get connected with myself so that I could do the work I was there to do without uh, bringing my uh, un kind of helpful baggage into the work. And I want to just, you know, share that uh, if there's anything at all that I can do to be su supportive or helpful to the amazing people in this room who I know have stories to tell, and it is hard work. I, I want to, like, you know, not make it sound as easy. It's hard work to write a book, but it's possible. If I can do it, I'm not a writer. If I can do it, every single person here who has a powerful story that can bring about change can do it, and I am so willing to be any support I can because I only managed to do it because of the help I got. So that's pretty much what I have to say.